Warren, how would you define true success? Well, I've, I've said many times that, that, that if you get to be 65 or 70 and later, and, and the people that you want to have love you actually do love you, you're a success. I've never seen anybody that reaches that age. I mean, I'm not talking about somebody that's in extreme poverty or pain or something, but I've never seen anybody that, if they have a lot of people that, that love them, that is other than happy, and I've seen some very, very wealthy people that they give testimonial dinners to and name schools after and everything. They're, nobody, nobody loves them, you know. Their own kids would say, he's in the attic, he's in the attic, you know. <laughs> they never came. <laughs> What are, say, three pieces of advice you would give to people who are looking to succeed in business? Well, I, by far the best investment you can make is in yourself. I mean, uh, for example, communication skills. I tell the students that come that uh, they're going to graduate schools and business and they, they're learning all these complicated formulas and all that. If they just learn to communicate better, in, both in writing and in person, they increase their value at least 50%. You know, I mean, it, 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 uh, if you can't communicate, somebody says, you know, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens, you know, basically. And and you have to be able to get get forth your ideas, and uh, and that's that's relatively easy. I did it myself with the Dale Carnegie course. Some people wish I'd taken a shorter course now <laughs> in terms of my talking later on, but it, it it's just hugely important. And you, if you invest in yourself, nobody can take it away from you. I mean, you you and. Uh, the second thing, which I'll get a certain criticism for not living it, but but I do tell the those students, you know, that if I gave you a car and it'd be the only car you get in the rest of your life, you, you take care of it like you can't believe. Any scratch you'd fix that moment, you read the owner's manual, you keep a garage and do all these things, and you get exactly one mind and one and one body in this world. And and you can't start taking care of it when you're fifty. By that time you'll have rusted out if you haven't done anything. So you you should you should really make sure that you just remember that you just got one mind and body to get through life with and to do the most with it. What about life advice? Well, life advice is, uh, you know, the most important thing, uh, aside from the things I've talked about already, is, is really who you associate with. You want to associate with people that are better than you are. I mean, basically, you'll go in the direction of the people that you associate with, and, and you want to have the right heroes. Uh, you want people, if you want to emulate somebody, you better pick very carefully who you want to emulate. And, uh, and when, obviously, you can't pick your parents. Uh, uh, they're going to have enormous influence on you, but you don't get a choice on that. But you get choices as you go down the line. And you, uh, who, you, uh, who you admire, who you, who, you, who you want to copy, and the most important for most people in terms of that decision is their spouse. It's also important in terms of a partner in business, but the partner in life is, is, is the most important one. You, you want to pick a spouse that's, that'll, that's better than you are. <laughs> and then he or she, and, hope, and you hope they don't f figure it out too fast. <laughs> Great. Biggest mistakes people make when investing? Well, they, they, they try to, they, they, they just don't realize that all you have to do is just buy a cross section of America and then never listen to people like me or read the papers or do anything subsequently. It, uh, they, think, they think that because you can trade, you should trade. They, you buy a farm, you buy an apartment house, you can't resell it tomorrow, and, you know, the cost of moving around. Or you, now you get something handed to you, liquidity, you know, which is instant, you can sell, and the, the cost of doing it are pennies you know, compared to other kinds of investment activity. So because they can, so easily move around, they do move around, and moving around is not smarter than investing. You have a pretty cool uh, morning routine regarding what you have for breakfast and how prosperous you feel. What is that? Well, uh, that uh, I now actually send somebody over to McDonald's usually to get me something. <laughs> since 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 the publicity I got from earlier describing my habits at McDonald's, <laughs> I I now somebody have them have somebody go in the office, but uh, that was. That was uh, more for entertainment value. I, I actually eat, I eat exactly what I like to eat. If, if I liked it on my sixth birthday, at my sixth birthday party when we had hot dogs and hamburgers and Coke and ice cream with chocolate, I still like it. And I don't care about anything subsequently. That <laughs> I, I discovered it all by the time I was six. And 
if, if somebody had offered me a deal when I was 20 and said, you're going to live one year longer, you know, instead of living to 88, you'll live to 89 or whatever it may be, if you eat nothing but broccoli and Brussels sprouts and onions and all these things. You know, I, I just said, I'll, you know, take the last year off. It probably won't be that good anyway. You know, I mean, so I, uh, I eat what I like to eat. I, 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 uh, I, I'm not venturesome in that area. I like how you've lumped in onions with broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Well, I've never heard I, that before. I, I just don't happen to like onions, but uh, no, that, I don't put them in the same category. Okay. <laughs> you and George H.W. Bush, I think. Um, is business school worth it? Depends on the person, and, uh, much more than it depends on the school. I mean, I, I wouldn't worry. Some people are going to get a lot out of advanced education, and some people are going to get uh, very little. And uh, I, I don't even think it's important that every person go to college at all. I mean, uh, we have all kinds of jobs that 70 or so thousand a year, 80,000 a year, that c college training is, is, is not of use. And, and I, I actually was not keen on going to college really? myself. Yeah, my dad uh, kind of jollied me into it. He could get me to do anything. But and if they'd had an SAT test in those days, he would have taken the test for me. <laughs> but because but, uh, I, I just, I, I was, I, I, I knew I could have a good time and I, I liked investing and I didn't really feel, I, I, I could read the books. Uh, uh, so I don't, you know, it's, it's a big commitment to take four years and the, the cost involved and maybe the loans involved and everything. And I think depending on what your interests are in life, uh, I don't, th I don't think it's for everybody. I think it's for a lot of people, uh, but there ought to be a reason you're going. And I didn't really see much reason. All right, last question. It's a lightning round, so there's a few. Um, do you ever drink water? Only under uh, duress. <laughs> what is your favorite all-time song, Warren? Uh, it, it's undoubtedly, it, it's my way. What about movie? Favorite movie? Well, I like the bridge on the river Kwai because of the, the, there were a lot of lessons in that. Plus it was, you know, enormously fascinating. Catchy tune also. Pardon? Catchy tune also. Yeah, yeah right. very. Right. But that, the ending of that was uh, sort of the story of life, you know. Is, is, he created the railroad. <laughs> and and did, he really, did he really want the, the enemy to come in across it, you know. It, Got it. Favorite book? Well, the favorite book from an investor, the, the book that had the most impact on my life was The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I knew you were going to say that. Um, favorite TV show? Mm, it's, it's probably going to be, uh, uh, it would be Nebraska in some huge bowl game and winning. <laughs> and finally, what do you carry in your wallet and how much money do you tend to carry around? Well, I probably carry uh, maybe four hundred dollars. Uh, I I actually uh, my wa my wife likes to use the cash, so I I just take home uh, a, a chunk of cash every now and then. And then she doles it out. She looks at my billfold and sees whether all the hundreds are gone. <laughs> Six of you in that way. But, uh, it's it's pretty simple. And the credit cards? I've got an American Express card which I got in nineteen sixty four, but I I pay cash. 98% of the time. If I'm in a restaurant, I always pay cash. It's just easier. Warren Buffett, thanks very much. Ray Dalio, the founder, co-CIO, and co-chairman of Bridgewater Associates. Thanks so much for joining us today. That's a kick to be with you. Yeah, so we're here at TechCrunch Disrupt, and you are now uh, the, the face of an app, right? Principles. And it's been getting a lot of heat and traction over the last couple of months. What is the success story behind Principles, and why do you feel like it's been performing well? Uh, to know how to fail well. You know, and to realize it's the path to success, to um, know that knowing how to deal with one's not knowing is more important than anything one knows, to know how to have an idea meritocracy and to know how to have fun and go after your dreams and make that happen. And so it's a kick to pass that along. So it's really interesting, the app itself, they, uh, you're, you're giving people the opportunity to craft their own principles, right? In addition yeah. to following yours, it's almost like, okay, this can be your vision board as well. What would you say is the most creative sorts of principles that you've seen others contribute to the platform? Well, we're just starting to collect the principles. So I, I, 
But, um, you know, there's the themes that you see over and over again, and they're true. Yep. So uh, I, I wouldn't make the generalization. I can't imagine the ones that I would say are the most creative, but they're mostly um, how to get past the challenges, the pains, and all of that. So I, I would say maybe those. <laughs> As you look at your principles personally, what is the most challenging one for you to really hold true to, or you feel as though you face the most obstacles in trying to make sure you're consistently uh, meeting that principle? Well, I don't know if it's the most, it's the most valuable one is to meditate. Mm. I would say it's not the most challenging, but I want to do it the most because that gives me the equanimity, the uh, creativity that really helps so much. So I would say that would be one of the most important, certainly. You've rolled out some new tools as well to really help entrepreneurs and leaders. Can you explain um, the, the new push here? Well, um, I want to pass along all the tools that have been helpful because tools create habit, they create a, f a framework that allows all these uh, principles to be carried through. I want really an idea meritocracy. That's the most important thing. And so the tools allow that. So I'm passing along first the dot collector. So everybody's going to be available for you able to use the dot collector. I think that'll be terrific. It's our most loved and most impactful tool. And what would you say is the success story? What is your vision for principles as you look ahead to a year or two from now? How would you define success? Well, at every phase in anyone's life, there's a difference in what is defines what one defines success. For me, um, at this stage, I, my definition for success is to help people be successful without me. In other words, to pass along and to watch. Institutional memory, yeah. Well, to watch beauty happen. I feel I'm I'm 70 years old. I don't want any more success myself. I just want to help pass that along, and if I can do that, that'll be success for me, and then I'll go quiet. I'm going to <laughs> go quiet in about a year, year and a half, I think. You know, some core tenets of the concept of principles and of Bridgewater are really radical transparency, radical open-mindedness. When you look at Silicon Valley, where we are right now, what would you say are the pros or, or some some of the startups and companies out here that are doing that well. Can you name a few leaders that come to mind? Um, I'm not gonna, it's all personal and I yeah. keep it private, so I'm not gonna name leaders. But I will say that some of the most successful, innovative companies, and then some of the startups that are just getting going are um, open-minded and thinking about new and better ways of doing things. So Silicon Valley, I love it because they really re resonate the idea of meritocracy, to know one's strengths and one's weaknesses, to work in a community where there's meaningful work and meaningful relationships. It resonates here, so that receptivity is really big here. And you know, you personally have really taken to social media platforms like Twitter, like LinkedIn, to really be an author, right? In addition to your book, and you're finding avenues to express yourself and engage with customers and people who are interested in your words. Would you say LinkedIn is the best portal? Oh, I, I want to clarify what I'm doing. Like yeah. I'm, I, I was sort of like hesitant. I'm going to go on yeah. social media, and I don't know, and and I'm not doing it for most of those reasons. I'm doing it because I'm having quality exchanges with people. You know, every day we're exchanging thoughts on principles and we're having the back and forth and the people are really nice and they're very appreciative and I love communicating with them. So, uh, you know, I like that. Um, we're communicating in very honest ways, but most importantly, it's quality. Like, what are you facing? And to realize that whatever you're facing, there's a principle for it, yep. right? To not view each of these individual things as individual things, but part of that principle. That back and forth exchange has been really well I'm loving the communication. I want to briefly touch upon your latest LinkedIn post where mm. you specifically are addressing uh, the administration potentially uh, curbing some of the investments into China and the capital flows there. Would you say that is the optimal scenario? Is that the way that the U.S. government should be going about relations with China? No, I wouldn't say that. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm. There are four types of wars, yep. right? There's a trade war, there's a capital and currency war, there's a technology war, and then there's a geopolitical war. And I'm seriously concerned about the, the nature of those wars. So, um, it, you know, it has to be done, this exchange of how you accomplish things really should, we shouldn't even be using the term war, we're using it too easily. We should be using the term negotiation, I think. 
So, um, you know, the question is, how much will this be a fight in which there's mutually hurting each other? Is this a win-win or a lose-lose? However we can get to a win-win, that's what I would like to see the most of. It's the art of thoughtful disagreement. And how do you create win-wins that I would like to see the most of? So I'm, I, th I would say, more concerned about conflict than the way that we're having it. And when you think about that win-win scenario, what does that look like You know, for, for the U.S. and China? Well, do you I, see that sort of compromise happening? I, th I don't think it's just the U.S.-China. I think it's a, an American-American thing. In other words, I think when we're dealing with conflict, we're now saying, can we go above it so that we don't make it a lose-lose, so that we know how to get what we each want through exchanges, like you tell me what you want and let me see if I can help you get it and let's do the same so that we build on win-wins. I think we're having the same challenges domestically. There's a wealth gap and there's a, an opportunity gap and then there's a conflict between increasingly extremes um, and, oh, and a fight that can become a, a really dangerous fight and, a, and, and produce a lose-lose. So I think the issue is to go above, if we can go above it, and we say, how do we get the best collective benefit and work on that? That's, that's, and there are lots of ways we can do that, but that is, I think, the most important thing. Because if you look about what we can have, there is enough, okay, there is enough of everything, and there's an innovativeness, and there's a, a capability, but so often, there's been these lose-loses that can then be very damaging. So I'm concerned about that. So like the wealth gap, like the opportunity gap, um, the idea of coming together and working it together and understanding the art of thoughtful disagreement. Principles, we'll go back to principles. What are the principles that bind us together? Are we clear on those? What are the principles that separate us? So I think we have to think about how we do this in a together way before we really damage ourselves because it can get so extreme that it can be damaging. And on that point, when you think about unity within America, uh, of course, there seems to be a lot of divide within the U.S. political system when you think about the impeachment inquiry uh, that Nancy Pelosi did start on President Trump. Do you feel like that will be a headwind for the markets as you think about the next couple of months? I read history and I find the same things happen over and over again. And what I see is that there is a, bil a political system that uh, normally has an ability to debate things and get past that. And I'm worrying that this is a war that in which the damaging and the hurt of that war can be so great that it undermines the effectiveness of the system. History has shown that. If you look at the late 30s, for example, the polarity between the haves and the have-nots. The wealth gap was analogous, the opportunity gap was analogous, and the ability to get past that. So I'm more concerned about that. I think there are three big forces that are at work. That's the domestic uh, economic gap and political gap, which is becoming extreme, and I worry about a downturn in which, number two, monetary policy won't be as effective in the next downturn. If we're at each other's throats now, and then you have a downturn, and it's going to be worse. Yep. And if we, and then we have the conflict in terms of the uh, rising China as a rising country with um, the United States as an established country, and so to work oneself through that in the right ways with wisdom to understand the art of thoughtful disagreement and get at the right aggregate rather than an everyone lose situation. That's what, uh, yeah, so that's what worries Hopefully me. Hopefully we and can achieve that soon. Thank you so much, Ray, for joining Hopefully we can achieve it soon. Steve Schwartzman, CEO of the Blackstone Group and the best-selling author of What It Takes. It's so great to be back with you again. Good to see you again. All right, well, Steve, the last time we talked, you gave me an answer to a question that I asked you about that you didn't think that you would be hired at Blackstone if you were to apply today. So my follow-up to that is, do you worry that Blackstone and maybe other firms might be missing out on the next Steve Schwartzman? Well, I, I think it's always hard uh, to know exactly who to pick when you have a qualified uh, pool. I, I'm quite sure, unfortunately, I wouldn't be picked because I wasn't uh, Magna or Summa. Uh, and, um, we, we, we talked at our management committee uh, uh, about this issue, and, and I asked how many of you were, only like eight people, nine people, 
How many of you were magna or summa? One hand went up. How many of you were cum laude? No other hands went up. So the rest of us were like generic people uh, and uh, were pretty flexible. Uh, and you know, as organizations grow, uh, you, you end up you know, uh, sometimes hiring really uh, very bright uh, people. But I, I think um, that people who have a balance, you know, it, it's good to be smart, um, obviously, uh, but, but having leadership skills is really important. And, and playing sports is, is good too. And the reason for that is, is you learn to take pain uh, and it's, it's not easy to be successful. Um, you know, it, it requires a lot of effort, uh, a lot of setbacks. Uh, it's a little bit like sports, you get thrown on the ground, you, you gotta get up. Uh, so um, we, we, we hire less than 1% of the people who apply. It's, it's surreal. Uh, and we, we have amazing people, uh, but we, 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 we always make sure that we have a few of them, like, like myself, with more generalized skills. And it's some, something we're always refining. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been in this business for decades. I do want to go back and revisit some of your early years. In your book, you wrote that at DLJ, I was never trained properly. I would cower in my office hoping no one noticed me, scared that I would be found out as ignorant or incompetent. I must have been the biggest buyer of antiperspirant on the east side of Manhattan. And then when you were at Lehman Brothers, you told this story about working months on this fairness opinion. You submit it, you're so proud of it, and then you get this phone call from your boss that there's a typo on page 56. So. I have to ask you, how formative were those experiences and how did it shape the way you built the culture at Blackstone? Yeah, well, um, everybody knows that sometimes when you start out, uh, it's a rough ride. Uh, and it, it, was, it was definitely rough for me. I had no training and I was, I was like the person in, in a class at school who whenever they asked somebody to open the class, you, you try and position yourself behind somebody else's head uh, so, so you wouldn't get called on. Uh, and th that was because I wasn't trained. And, and so um, w what happens is, is when you have these bad experiences, uh, you, you don't forget. Uh, and when you, you, you sort of make a, you know, sort of a vow to yourself that, w that if you ever got into a position uh, of authority, you wouldn't do that to anybody else. Mm -hmm. you, you, want thing, you want people to, to be as prepared as they can be. You want as low, uh, as, low as stress environment for them. You, you want them to understand that they can ask questions. Uh, I mean, I'm in the financial business and almost everything's been invented before you did it. You know, certainly for your first few years. So let's, let's not have you struggle. It, it's, it's absolutely okay to ask questions to, to, as a shortcut. Uh, you're not allowed to ask the same question over and over again, which means you've learned nothing. Uh, but the idea that you have to struggle, uh, let, let's, let's eliminate that. And so each of these um, uh, unhappy uh, experiences, uh, we have a great training program now because I want everybody to be trained. I, I want everybody to be comfortable. Well, I do want to also talk about the fact that you excelled from an early age on Wall Street. I think you were one of the youngest managing directors at Lehman Brothers by age 31. Um, but fast forward to today, and then even looking out in the future, how do you think the financial services industry has changed, and is it still a viable place for young people to go? Yeah, it's a financial business is, is still really good. It's just changed. Uh, uh, and as long as you're printing in the United States an extra trillion dollars a year, uh, of money uh, over and above what you would normally do with these deficits, there's always plenty of money uh, and plenty of new things uh, that you can do. Um, at, at places that are larger, our place has uh, 2,500 people, so it's not that big. Uh, you, you design uh, people's careers, so, so if you're really terrific, you, you move faster. The, the idea that the world has to be rigid uh, to make life easy uh, discourages having, you know, people of uh, great uh, talent. And I, I, I love people who have talent. I was, I was always sort of a bit frustrated by being held back. 
And why, why should we do that? Uh, so, so you don't have to be a big thinker. You just look at things that don't make sense and say, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I also think it's also interesting, you have these rules for life, you talk about finding problems and solving them, you say that there's nothing more interesting to people than their own problems. Think about what others are dealing with and try to come up with ideas to help them. I mean, it makes me think of when you were in high school, you brought on a cool rock band, you changed the rules at Yale so women could spend the night on dorms, you also made sure that the folks you are in the army with got fed, they weren't feeding them breakfast when they were doing their morning tours, and you also solved problems, whether it was business school, Wall Street. So what was the inflection point for you that you were looking to solve problems in your life and realize, hey, this is actually good for being successful? Well, um, whenever you're in, in any kind of situation, uh, the reason you're there is something's going on. And, and what you really want to know uh, is what is the problem that you're solving? And the only way you learn that is is you think you have an idea, but it's really the other person you have to understand. And, and what's, what's on their mind? And uh, how do you address uh, their issues? If, if you're like a long, young person, let me pretend you're, you're in an advisory capacity. Uh, all you want to know uh, from your client is what are you worried about? What are you thinking about? Um, and it, 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 once you understand that, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to create solutions. If you're just guessing about what, what's on their mind, you'll, you'll waste a lot of time and, and maybe not get the right thing. Well, I do want to talk about the problems that this generation will be facing. Um, right now, we're in the middle of trade negotiations, and I know you wrote about this. You are involved in that process. It's been ongoing. You write that it's some of the most difficult negotiations you've ever experienced. So. Steve, are we going to see a deal anytime soon? And what has to happen for us to see a deal? Well, that's, that's almost an unfair question because the Chinese are sitting in a room uh, either right now or they just broke with the Americans. So it'll be announced. And what, what I uh, think might happen today do doesn't really matter because today's almost over. Uh, and we'll all know uh, where things are. But fundamentally, um, we're asking the Chinese to uh, change their system. Uh, their system uh, was brilliantly uh, designed as an emerging market, developing market economy, uh, so, so that much like the Americans in the 19th century, people forget we had very high tariffs. We were a small country. We had, you know, the ability to protect, uh, you know, our nascent industries. And China just started doing this 40 years ago. And, and they've had an astonishing result. Um, you know, they, 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 40 years ago, they had GDP per capita of a few hundred dollars, and, and now it's $10,000, and it's going up at $1,000 a year. Uh, so, so China has done some remarkable things, but they've done it in, in ways that are inconsistent uh, with the developed world. They have very high tariffs and taxes, three times as high uh, to bring a product into China as it is for China to sell one in the United States. You would assume, if that were the case, the, the person who gets in at a very cheap price would do better, and, and they do. Uh, it's the same way with markets opening. It's selectively open, but not like the U.S. has been. And, and so uh, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a time for adjustment. The question is, how fast will an adjustment come, over what time frame, and how dramatically at each point? Because no one would give up their entire system because someone else asked them to do it. So we're doing the asking, and they have their own internal politics. They've got their hardliners, which is basically, things have been really good for us, mm -hmm. plus we don't like being pushed around. Uh, which they were, you know, by, by the developed world for the last 100 to 200 years. And they don't like it. Um, on the other hand, you have the reformers who say, look, we realize that we, we should be more open. We'll, we'll learn best practices uh, from the West. It'll be good for us. So in a way, uh, these negotiations are um, somewhat hostage uh, to, to what China wants to do. 
Uh, and, and there are two elements in China. Just like we have internal politics in the United States, um, our, our view that they're a monolith and they don't have internal points of view is wrong. So, so we'll see what's happening. It's an exciting time now. Are you optimistic? Um, it depends on what criteria. If you're looking for a full solution uh, to the differences between uh, the U.S. and China, uh, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking for, for something less than that, uh, we'll, we'll have to see what China is prepared to put on the table. Well, Steve, you're no stranger to the White House. I know you've engaged with several administrations, and you wrote about this in the book that, quote, from the moment Donald Trump was elected president, I had been getting calls from people who did not know what to make of him. They had listened to him during the campaign and were nervous about what he might do. So what do you tell folks? What do people get wrong about President Trump? Well, that, that would take a long time uh, to, to answer that question. But if you could uh, you know, narrow it down to one thing that people get wrong. Well. Um, I, 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 I had a lot of people from f foreign countries, as well as, well as domestic people, uh, sort of approach me. Um, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump lived in New York, uh, you know, for his whole life, and we're in New York now, and New York isn't as big a town uh, as it seems on the outside. And, and so a lot of people knew, uh, uh, knew, knew Donald Trump. and. Um, Nobody knew what he would be like uh, in a presidential uh, position. Um, and, and so they were basically without um, any knowledge and, and had a lot of concerns about it. And so, you know, I, I would meet with them and see what was on their mind and see if I could solve some of the issues. But, you know, one, one of the things um, is, is that um, all, all of these tweets are are not worth listening to. Uh, and for some reason, everybody is focused on them all. I, I, I never have been. Uh, you know, some of them are just indicative of sort of a general area of concern uh, and aren't meant to be taken literally. And, you know, with today's news media, um, it doesn't matter whether it's left or right, uh, people just hang on every word. Uh, I, I've always thought that would drive them sort of nuts, and that's, that's where they've ended up uh, as a society. And, you know, I think you have to wait to see something of uh, real importance that's um, more considered, but that, that's not what the media is doing. Um, and, and so you get all this uh, uh, confusion uh, and uh, focus where they're probably shouldn't be focused, but it's just my point of view. All right, well, we are coming up on the 2020 election, and you are the son of a dry goods seller. You are the American dream. You are now the 100th richest person in the world, according to the Forbes list. But as we approach the election, you're seeing more and more candidates come out proposing a wealth tax. You have one who says billionaires shouldn't exist. You're also seeing polls that are more favorable towards socialism. So what is your response to that? Well, there are a bunch of different uh, responses uh, as to this thing about billionaires uh, shouldn't exist. That uh, y if you look at who these people are, uh, they, they didn't become prosperous sitting and just watching uh, television. Uh, these are people who started businesses. And every place where everybody works w was started by somebody. Uh, and, and that's the way the world works. And the people who take that risk and start those businesses and end up, you know, either you're hiring 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people. That's where people work. Uh, and those people make more money. Uh, and, and what happens is they become uh, affluent. Most of them fail, by the way. Nine out of 10 businesses that are started result in failure. So if, so if you're one of the people who make it through that, you're providing employment and prosperity and in effect tax revenue. And, and you have a bunch compared to other people. Uh, and then uh, you get older and you pass away and, and, and the laws 
uh, you know, sort of tax away uh, most of what you uh, have owned. It's already, it's already been taxed once already, typically. Uh, and then that's dispersed, and, and then that wealth disappears. Uh, you know, and, and, and so that's, um, that, that's, what, that's how these people get created. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in terms of a wealth tax, um, I, I don't remember whether t there are 210 or 220 countries in the world, and only four of them have a wealth tax. If it was such a good idea and it was so easy to raise money, you'd have loads of them. You've had more than four and they give it up. So why did they give it up? So, so Yahoo uh, addresses a lot of younger people, people who want to start uh, businesses. And, and here's how this would work if you were trying to start uh, a business and you got venture capital money. Uh, make pretend that you were successful uh, and your company, make it really a good success, uh, was um, worth a billion dollars on a valuation basis. And you started it uh, so you had $300 million of the billion. Uh, but you probably had um, a salary of somewhere around $300,000. So, so what would happen is you'd end up with $150,000 after tax. And if you had a 1% tax, you'd owe another $3 million. So how are you going to pay $3 million of taxes when you only have $150,000. So this would be a terrible situation to have created something, be successful, and be hemorrhaging financially. So that's how a wealth tax works. And what would happen with that person is they would not want to stay in the United States. And leave. They would leave, but what's more important is people who would come here to start businesses wouldn't come because the success would be taxed away in a wealth tax. And, and so what is logical is those people would find another place to go and there would be another ecosystem developed. You would have, I think, countries offering them tax-free zones to do their business. Uh, and you would basically create a huge dislocation for the United States. So, so I, th I think there are reasons why wealth taxes don't exist. Uh, and I just gave you one of several. Well, uh, before we let you go, um, you're a problem solver. You look for big problems and you want to find solutions. We're starting to see some of your peers, I'm thinking Ray Dalio of Ridgewater Associates, um, Salesforce's Mark Benioff come out and say the current capital system is broken. So using that problem solver mentality, Steve, how would you advise that we fix it? Well, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that um, as a result of a Fed study done two years ago, that 40% of Americans, the Fed said, uh, couldn't write a $400 check in an emergency. So what that means is this 40% of the population basically doesn't have savings. And they are having a really, really tough time, which is why our politics has become uh, poisonous, uh, because, because we've got a large percentage of our population uh, that's not doing well. And um, I, I think you have to address that. Uh, first, you, you have to uh, provide more money uh, for these people. Uh, and I think there are a lot of different policy approaches. I, I think a good place to start uh, is to increase the minimum wage uh, up to $15. Uh, th this is actually a tax on the business community, right? Uh, you know, because you're taking profits away from them. Uh, to, to give them to uh, uh, workers. That takes care uh, of, of, of significantly increasing money for 15% of the population. Uh, but what happens is the people who used to be getting more than the minimum wage, they have to be boosted up when you're close to doubling. So, so this ends up affecting somewhere around 35% of the population. Uh, and, and it's got lots of knock-on uh, effects. That's the first thing. But capitalism uh, isn't uh, 
broken per se. Uh, what, what's been broken is our educational system. So, so when I was younger, um, which apparently was a long time ago, but I didn't get the, the word on it, um, that, that the US was one of the top two or three education systems in the world. We've now fallen somewhere between number 25 and 30. And in math, we're solidly in the 30s. If you're producing a workforce that is dramatically inferior to competitors on the global scale, we're going to have a lot of trouble. Uh, I was just in China uh, a few weeks ago, and I was meeting with the, one of the top few people in, the, in, the, in their government. And, and he was telling me, he said, you know what we're going to do in, um, in education? We spent an hour on education. And he said, we're going to uh, require that every student in China take computer science. And I'm sitting there going, OMG. <laughs> in the United States, we probably have 5% of our primary and secondary students taking computer science. It is not capitalism that's broke. Imagine we're competing with a country where everybody is computer literate and we've got hardly anybody. This is not a recipe for long-term success. Uh, and and it's, it's not about capitalism. We have to put the best possible individuals and, 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 and training uh, on the playing field. Uh, that's how you win uh, the game. Uh, and we're just not uh, doing what we need to do in, in that area. And if you deliver those people to a workforce, you're, you're really disadvantaged. So I have a slightly different take. Uh, you know, um, uh, these, these are government issues, uh, by the way. Uh, they're, they're not business uh, issues. But there are a lot of things that business can do to help train people. We have to do that. You know, we, we have to make sure that students who aren't necessarily on a college track do stuff like they do in Germany, you know, where the business community, you know, trains those people for real jobs, takes them on board, uh, and gives them good careers. So we have a lot of levers uh, that we can play with uh, to have better outcomes for the people in the country, and, and we have to do that. This is not optional. Well, you know what I think? These sound like generational opportunities. Steven Schwarzman, CEO of the Blackstone Group, thank you so much for joining us at the Yahoo Finance All Market Summit. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.